Good evening and welcome to East Hampton Media's Voter Forum. Tonight we're going to interview and ask some questions to school committee candidates and I'd like to introduce them. Peter Gunn, Sarah Hunter, thank you for coming, thank you. Angelique Baker, and Marissa Carrera. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for your participation. So um, in lieu of an opening statement, um, I just want to ask each of you, and if we could just go in that order and then we can sort of stagger in that order. And I'm going to give you two minutes to respond as an ad hoc uh, opening statement. Um, why do you want to be? Why are you running for school committee? Well, first I want to thank East Hampton Media for giving the voters in East Hampton an opportunity to meet the eight candidates. And I also want to thank all of the other candidates for giving the voters in East Hampton a choice. We've had a couple of election cycles where that hasn't been the case, and I think it's terrific that there are more candidates running now than ever before. Uh, since actually the first time uh, that I was elected. Um, in 2007, uh, I threw my hat in the ring because there were a number of uh, articles in the paper that summer where the school committee was struggling to have a quorum um, and unable to conduct its business. And as someone who was looking for a way to become more involved in the city and trying to think of what I could bring by way of an expertise, as an experienced educator, I said, I think this is an area where I could contribute. So I've ran, was elected. I've served as the secretary of the school committee. I've also served as the chair of the school committee. And now I serve as a regular member. And I think my primary reason for, for running is that I was concerned um, at the number of my colleagues who are not running for re-election. Um, I think at some point East Hampton should address by, uh, by its charter the way we rotate everyone potentially in and out of office every two years. I think it would make much more sense if we staggered our uh, term of service um, and staggered our elections um, so that we would not have um, the possibility of a complete um, changeover on the city council and the mayor and the school committee. Um, so my primary reason for running is that I still have a deep desire to help um, the young people in East Hampton. Um, and the best way I think I can do that is by contributing to uh, you know, my ideas and my, my voice uh, to the quality of the educational experience that they have. And I bring my experience as a teacher, as someone whose children have attended um, the public schools in East Hampton, um, and as a longstanding member of the committee uh, in the hope that that will appeal to the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Sarah? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, okay. why, why are you running for school committee? So I'm running for the school committee um, because I believe very much uh, that we should be serving the public in whatever capacity we can as citizens. Um, I have a history in education. I went to the University of Toronto and got a master's degree in sociology and equity studies and education. My master's thesis was on um, including students with autism in the general public school um, environment uh, in a more inclusive way. And um, I've also, so I've taught before as a, um, as a high school teacher for students with autism. I've also worked as a special ed paraprofessional uh, in Greenfield and in Holyoke. I currently work at the Department of Developmental Services in Holyoke where I uh, work with adults who have disabilities. And before that I worked for community resources with pe for people with autism in East Hampton. And I learned there that um, through working with parents in their homes, parents of kids with special needs in the community that um, a lot of parents were not very satisfied with the special ed services that they were receiving in East Hampton. Um, and since I live here and I pay taxes and I care a lot about the schools and I know a lot of kids who go to school here and that's something that I have a background in, I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to serve. Um, so that's pretty much what, what I'm bringing with me. I also have a background in uh, facilitation, um, active listening and kind of working with groups of people who don't always necessarily agree with each other. I believe a lot in just listening and trying to get as much information as I can and trying to get people to find common ground with each other. So um, when I heard that the school committee was uh, expecting a few vacancies, I was excited to uh, jump in there. And uh, I'm excited for the uh, opportunity to do that. So thank you. Great, Angelique. I have three kids in the school system. They're scattered out preschool, fourth grade, and high school. So I'm here for a long time, and I've been very involved in the schools. Uh, and I want to um, participate in, um, in a different sort of way. Um, I wanted to kind of bring some diversity and try to represent the people that um, don't know that there's a school committee, or how to get involved, or um, maybe can't make it to meetings. Or, um, I think um, I'm on the Commission Disabilities for East Hampton already, 
um, and that's something that um, overflows with with um, my some of my concerns with the special ed issues not being met fully um, in the schools. Um, I also uh, feel really strongly about accessibility. Um, like I said, I'm pretty involved in the schools and I didn't even know there was a school committee and so I feel like if I didn't know that there are probably other people that didn't know. So, um, and I've also um, tried to talk to the school committee in the past and I've never heard back any of my emails. So I want to change that. Like I want to be talked to in the playground. I want um, people to write, write me emails and know that I'm going to get back to them. Um, I want to hear about what other people are concerned about and see what I can do, not just to help my kids, but it's a community. Um, some people know me because I'm buying a Habitat for Humanity house, so um, like I'm, I'm, I'm here to stay and I want them to know that I'm, I'm committed. Great. Um, I also want to say thank you for having us all here tonight. Um, I've been an East Hampton resident for almost 10 years, and my husband and I just purchased a home last year here. And we're really happy to be raising our family in East Hampton. Um, Oliver is um, a second grader at Maple School, and Louisa is six months old, and she will join the public schools when she's of age. Um, I am an educator myself um, with a doctor I teach at UMass Amherst and Amherst College, um, courses on public policy and the history of public education. So schools are really important to me, um, both personally as a mother and then also professionally as an educator. Um, I really feel like a strong advocate for equal and effective education as a sort of essential democratic good. Um, I think that there are a lot of exciting things going on in our district, um, a lot of great work happening in our learning communities here in East Hampton. And I'm really proud to have my, my child and eventually my children in our schools. I also see a lot of challenges here from talking with community members and people in the schools, challenges around um, budgets and physical facilities and, um, as Sarah and Angelique have mentioned, some um, limitations in our services and our resources for our kids. And so if I were to have the privilege of serving East Hampton as a school committee member, um, I would really want to bring my background as somebody who um, has thought a lot about education and is um, a, a careful researcher and careful thinker about these issues, and then also really see myself as somebody who's available to listen to families and to um, educators and staff and administrators who are in our buildings, and then also to taxpayers in our community at large. Um, so that way we can all work together toward developing solutions for these challenges. Great. Um, would we like to open up the floor to general discussion now? About sure. anybody's? No? I mean, it's not a question that really lends itself <laughs> to it, but I, I, I did say that, that was the format, so I wanted to give you the opportunity. Should we move on to question two? Sure. sure. So question two is, <clears throat> could you please define the authority afforded to you as a school committee representative as provided by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? And we're going to rotate for? Um, Sarah? <laughs> Okay, so um, my understanding is as a school committee member, um, I would have a responsibility to um, sort of both interact with the, um, the teachers, administrators, and the people, the, the um, people who are working in the schools, the students, and then also the parents um, who are sending uh, students to the schools. So um, I could serve as a point of contact from, from any of those people uh, regarding any issue in the school. Um, I do know that there is a budget committee and there's a policy committee. Um, I don't know a whole lot yet about kind of how much say those uh, committees have over the actual workings of the district, um, but I do understand that um, you know when I was working in a school, um, I understood that there were a lot of uh, decisions that were made um, by the school committee that we would have input into, but ultimately um, it was up to them um, in terms of bigger ideas uh, in regards to where our money was going or kind of bigger policy um, concerns. So, and I also, um, as a public servant currently, you know, I also understand that. Um, I would be speaking, like if I was speaking to a parent as a school committee member, I would be speaking as the school district. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand kind of what that means, what it is that you're saying, like not making promises that you can't keep, but also like being transparent and open and accessible and making sure that um, people know uh, what they're getting from you. So that's something that I would definitely keep kind of at the forefront of my mind as well. Angelique? I would just want to make sure that I was being the best advocate for those people that 
came to me with questions, make sure I do my research, get back to them. Um, in terms of um, how much power is afforded to me, I'm, I'm not really sure of that yet. Um, but I don't see it as a powerful position. Like I don't, I don't really see these people as my opponents either. Like I just feel like we're kind of people that care. And um, I mean, it doesn't mean I don't want to, you know, be chosen. But I, I feel like we're a team. And anybody that wants to put in some, some work to like help the schools is fantastic. So um, I, there'll be more to learn, I guess. Great, Marissa. Um, sure, it's probably a good thing that Peter's going last on this question because you actually will be able to. Um, oh, no, uh, just to um, the responsibilities of the school committee members. No, it, well, it's pleased to find the authority member. afforded the authority. to you as the school committee representative okay. as provided by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Right, yes. So, um, as I understand it, as a school committee member and the committee as a group, um, our authority and responsibility is really to review the policies that are laid out by administrators, specifically. Um, presented to us by the superintendent, and um, to double check that those policies are, in fact, in compliance with state and federal laws governing our education. Um, and then also to review and propose the budget um, that then the mayor has an opportunity to um, accept or, or to um, not accept. And then also, um, I believe that this part of the school committee's responsibility is to define the vision and mission for education um, in the district and sort of articulate what are the goals um, for all of our students from kindergarten through 12th grade. And I would say that each response so far is better informed than mine would have been in 2007. <laughs> you learn a lot when, when you're elected and um, I was told early on um, that you could boil the responsibilities and the authority of the school committee down to hiring a superintendent and voting a budget mm -hmm. every year. Experience has taught me that there's more, and you've all touched on the on the key pieces. Uh, we have a finance subcommittee which works on uh, budgetary issues. We have a policy subcommittee that works on any uh, changes in policy, um, and those tend to be broader policies. Um, but we do actually end up voting on things like the the um, you know the handbook for the high school and for mm -hmm. the various schools. Uh, and I think that Marissa's point about being visionaries is is important as well because I think in the setting of a budget and in the hiring and um, evaluation of the superintendent you're really having a conversation um, out loud about what East Hampton expects uh, to offer its children and so I, I think that the answers so far have captured you know most of what I understand uh, to be but again I will say that there's training offered by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees mm -hmm. for all new school committee members and there's regular ongoing training and, and there's a lot of details but those are the folks here have identified the the main points as I understand our responsibility and our authority oh, so the next question is a little more um, uh, indicative of what you'll actually be doing as school committee members and let's start with Angelique Angelique, how would you craft a budget to reflect educational excellence given the current financial restraints? How would I craft the budget? Um, so first I would need to learn more about the budget, um, the restraints that I'm aware of, um, the ones that I have heard of personally, um, are that we don't have enough money to, to get the help that each of the students needs. Um, so I guess I would review what's going on and see what we could change, um, slide over, or um, how we could raise more funds. Um, I understand that something it's tied into some of the high stakes testing. So I want to review that too. Um, again, not completely sure of my power in that position of what I could do, but I guess that's, that would be my plan. OK, great. It just takes me a second to reset the time. <laughs> Marissa? Sure. Um, yeah, so this is, a, of course, probably the toughest question. How do we solve the budget <laughs> problem? Mm -hmm. um, as I understand it, the most recent request for a budget was $18.1 million, about. And um, that budget was not able to get passed. We ended up with lesser than that. And so there's, we're facing a real problem where we can't even really maintain services at the level that they're at now, let alone make improvements. Um, so 
how to solve that problem. Um, I wish I really knew the answer. The one thing that I know is an issue that we've all been talking about um, is the, the charter school and school choice is a place where we can really identify a spot where we can work on the budget because those are tax dollars that are leaving our district and that there's real potential there to turn them back around and have them heading back into our district. And so um, that is a place where we can both look at um, improving the reputation of our district and really working on outre outreach to our families so that way people recognize the value of an East Hampton education and want to keep their kids here. And then also we need to think about how can we bolster our services so that way students don't need to leave East Hampton in order to get the education that they need. Um, in terms of other ways to um, seek out additional funds to really get to the budget that we need, that's the place where I would, um, as a new school committee member, I would really find it my responsibility to seek out the expertise of people who, who know more about this than me and to listen to what they might have to suggest and then to work with the committee and hopefully with some um, uh, veteran committee members who will have a little bit more experience on structuring the budget. Give me just a second. Sure. Time. Okay. Peter? I think the budget is really the beginning and the end of, of the, the story of the East Hampton public school system um, as it comes to the school committee. There's tremendous work that's done by our, our faculty and our kids produce great learning in remarkably constrained circumstances. Um, every day in the, in the school buildings. But at our level, the budget is always there. It's always on our minds. And, and the issues that have been identified already are, are ones that I hope are familiar to voters. Um, I think that the state's structure for financing of public education puts parents in this community in an extraordinarily difficult position of choosing between what is best for their child's education and what is best for their community. Um, I don't doubt that any parent who chooses to send their child uh, through school choice or charter schools is doing what they think is best. Um, but I don't think that any of them would like to, to go to bed at night or wake up in the morning realizing that the city of East Hampton is paying them to live here. But that's the reality. There are very few families that take advantage of charter or choice who pay as much in taxes as we then send out with their child. And it is the single best place that we can um, recover funds for the school budget, uh, for the city budget, and it is for the whole city budget. Um, you know, the schools didn't get everything that, that we would like um, to provide the enriched and enhanced educational opportunities that we believe our students deserve, but we were the one um, division within the, the city's uh, various departments that did see an increase um, in its budget this year. Um, we've not always been able to have level service budgets, um, but that you know, the the state has to has to change um, its financing methods. Sarah, all right. Um, well, I think that the challenges facing um, our budget our, our budget situation in the East Hampton public schools, first of all, are not unique to East Hampton. I think this is a problem that a lot of different communities are having across the state and across the nation. So it's important to keep that in mind because I think sometimes people get a little bogged down with you know we're doing everything wrong, why isn't it working, why can't we get it to work? And I think we need to remember that this is a national problem. It's not just a problem with East Hampton. That said, I definitely want to echo what other folks have said before me in regards to uh, the school choice and charter schools um, and the reputation of the East Hampton public schools. I've talked with a lot of parents who have had really good um, experiences here. I've also talked with a lot of parents of younger children who have heard of bad experiences in East Hampton and they're, they're moving out of the district. They're choicing their kids out of the district. I know several parents of four-year-olds who sold their houses and moved this year to Northampton. We can't be losing young families like this, and we can't be losing families to school choice who haven't even tried the schools here. So I don't really know um, what to do about that. Like, I'm not exactly sure how to address that at this point. Um, I would like to get to know the folks who are involved in the decision making a little bit better. I want to get to know the people who are um, going to the schools, the students who are attending, the, the teachers who are teaching here, the parents who are sending their kids here. And I just kind of want to see like how these decisions are being made, what are the things that have been tried in the past, um, what things are we, um, you know, what, what have we done, what haven't we done. And is there anything big that we're missing, like any big grant opportunities that we're missing or anything, you know, that we haven't looked into completely. Um, but I think it's something that we can, 
that we can do together, and I feel optimistic, but it's definitely not something I can do alone, so I'm glad I'm not the only one. So at this point, I'd like to open up the conversation for general discussion. If anyone heard anything, would like to comment or question each other about any of the answers that we heard. <laughs> we don't need to do general discussion. That's OK. Well, I, I guess <laughs> I would point simply out. point yeah. out that my position on, a, on an override has changed. Mm -hmm. um, in the last election, I ran explicitly promising to be a candidate who would push again for an override just for general funding for the city. In light of the progress that we've made with the Massachusetts Building Authority, I, I think I would reserve judgment on that in the hope that we can um, rally the folks in the community to support the construction of a new elementary school. I think that that is a higher priority in terms of our long-term budget planning than raising the, the, the broader tax base to fund all public services. Any other comments? I just wanted to say that like last night I went to a curriculum night and why it's not directly tied in with the with the funding like what I heard there was fantastic I didn't quite know about all the little progress that was being made in the classroom so I just want to highlight that um, and maybe not be a hundred percent negative on the, on the school <laughs> yeah, and I guess I could pick up on the same spirit and say that, um, as I understand it, even though our schools have a really limited budget, they've been making really great mm -hmm. use of every dollar that they've gotten. Mm -hmm. And so, in some cases, budget questions are about how can we trim out excess and how can we make our dollars work harder. Um, it seems like our schools are doing a really good job already mm -hmm. um, at, at making the most of what they do have. Okay, great. So, moving forward, um, this next question is, is my question actually. Um, how would you encourage, and this goes to Marissa first, how would you encourage volunteerism in the schools or how would you craft policy which incorporates volunteers? How active would you be in exposing new people to the district? Um, that's a really great question. Um, I know that my first introduction to the, my personal introduction to um, the districts was as a mother of a kindergartner in Ms. Chris's class at Maple, and Ms. Chris was really generous to allow me to volunteer once a week, and I was lucky that my work schedule was flexible enough that I was able to spend a couple hours every Thursday with the kindergartners, and it really gave me such um, a closer understanding of the school and so much more faith in the school. I felt a little nervous just sending my child into the buildings and not really knowing what was going on. But once I myself was in the buildings, I felt so connected and um, really assured at the great work that was happening in our district. So I would love to um, see more volunteers, not only because that can provide resources and, um, and extra help for um, the kids and the teachers, but also because they think it's a really important thing for community members and families to feel connected and to feel like they have access to schools. Um, so I think that there are, could be a lot of creative ways to get people involved. Um, we know social media is a new and great way to um, reach people, particularly young families who are involved in those kinds of um, avenues. And then and, um, really working on maybe making liaisons between school committee and the PTO as two organizations that um, have a lot of investment in getting volunteers into the schools and the PTO maybe has a little bit more access to, um, to the community and to parents themselves. So working together might be a, a great way to um, organize those volunteer opportunities. Great. Peter? Well, just last evening we were talking about intergenerational opportunities because of the demographics of East Hampton there's uh, an extraordinary untapped um, or largely untapped base that we are, are working to try to increase the involvement in the school and that is our, our senior citizens. That not only makes good educational sense, it is also economically and politically a strategically wise thing to do because um, folks who no longer have children in the schools may not know and may mm. um, not be able to um, counter some of the, the, the things that we've talked about that are concerns about East Hampton with actual you know, experience. And when mm -hmm. folks come to the schools and they see what's going on, they, they come away with the, the um, sense that Marissa did and that others who are in the schools have. Um, they see the great work that's done. Um, I know that um, we've also talked about having some of the high school students both 
you know, throughout the community come and work with elementary and middle school students um, in support roles, and that's a tremendous opportunity. It's a way for us to work at the language teaching concern because there's a, a desire for language instruction at earlier ages, and that's a way that we can do it. Um, and I think that, that people will find that there's two things you have to have. You have to be willing, number one, to, to make yourself available, and then you have to be willing to do what the schools need. Mm -hmm. It's really important that people arrive saying, what do you need us to help you do, rather than saying, I think this is what you need, and I'm here to do that. Um, and I think if you can do that, I know for me, working in the, in the high school with the history and government classes um, has been tremendously rewarding, um, but it was doing what they needed and coming to, to respond to specific requests that they had for kinds of help. And that's a fantastic way for people to get involved in the schools. I agree. I, I was just going to do that. It's <laughs> great that you asked that. Um, so, Sarah, how would you encourage volunteerism in the schools, or how would you craft a policy which incorporates volunteers? How active would you be in exposing new people to the district? OK, well, so I've lived in East Hampton for two years now. And one thing that I've learned um, from living here is that East Hampton is a town with a lot of Facebook groups, um, which might sound a little bit glib. But um, I've met a lot of people in town that way. I've met a lot of parents that way. I've gotten you know, news out about my campaign that way. And so I think like whatever we do, we need to make sure that there is some kind of online um, component. I don't think people realize how much they could be doing in the schools, people who are interested in volunteering. And I, I don't even mean just parents. I think it might be a really good way to get some of those young families with kids who are kind of on the fence about whether or not they want to stay in East Hampton um, to get them to come and um, kind of get involved with the schools before their kids are even enrolled. Um, you know, I, I think volunteer opportunities can go, can go from, you know, coming to a career day and speaking with students about what your job is to um, kind of helping out at a football game or um, selling snacks or, you know, doing some kind of weekend or evening event. Uh, we always need chaperones for dances, uh, which everybody loves. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there and I think, um, I think we definitely do need to let people know that they're out there and what they are. And, um, and we'll learn that by talking to teachers and talking to administrators who are kind of on the ground and know what their schools need. It's also a good way to uh, deal with some of the budget issues as well. You know, if we have um, people who are actively working on uh, coming up with school supplies or raising money for um, specific projects or trips or things like that. So I think there's a lot of good that we can do with volunteerism just in increasing the amount of commitment that the community has to the schools, which will, you know, end up um, changing the reputation of the schools, which is something that we talked about before. Um, so I think there's a lot of good, uh, good reasons to do that. I think we just, you know, we need to have a broad reach. We need to be checking out social media. We need to be kind of, uh, kind of catching people in unusual places, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. OK, great. So, so let me repeat the question okay. for you, because it's a long question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you encourage volunteerism okay. in schools, or how would you craft a policy which incorporates volunteers? How active would you be in exposing new people to the district? OK, so I will learn how to craft a policy if I'm chosen, and I would be um, I think my main thing that I would do is be available. I was thinking about, um, I know like the coffee with the cops and some other things have worked out good coffee with the mayor. So I think that I could definitely devote an hour or two weeks, like making myself accessible for people to come ask me questions, how it works. Um, and I just want to take us a, a little bit of a different angle on, on volunteering. Um, I think there's a lot of shame from parents that can't make it um, because they work or they're disabled. Um, or they're just afraid of the school. So I feel like volunteering starts with ask, maybe asking your kid like how their day was or helping them with homework because that has such a major trickle down effect to how the child then feels about school in general. Um, and then, it, uh, and that, it, that is volunteering. And um, I know with some other preschools, they actually count that and they, um, and they get funded from the government for every hour that the parent works on their EBCs or counts with their kids. So I think that that would be um, something I'd want to encourage more because we need to get people to realize just like such a small little thing is so huge and impactful. And then, um, of course, then the other things will follow. They'll follow right into place. People will feel more connected and then they'll show up for these things um, whether they have kids or they don't have kids. So I guess that's what I would do. <laughs> 
Great. Any open discussion? Would anyone like to expand on something that they heard? I think that coffee idea is a really good idea. Thank I like you. That. So we did have a superintendent uh, in the town where I live in who did regular coffee hours. Mm -hmm. She went okay. around to different sites. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of scattered rural district. So, so that, that was helpful. A lot of people enjoyed that kind of outreach and the accessibility of just being able to talk to yeah. the lady behind the desk. People or love coffee. Or maybe yeah. at a park, because if people have kids um, and they want to be able to talk, maybe their kids can be over here. And I know that some of the events they offer childcare, and that's so, I mean, sometimes that's the difference between if I'm coming and volunteering or not. And yeah. um, so if we're able to keep doing that and funding that, that would, and, or having volunteers, actually, I think it's volunteers that usually do that. That would be so helpful. Keep it up. Mm -hmm. OK, so moving on to the next question, we're shifting gears a little bit. But Peter, I'm going to start with you. How do you envision the partnership between the school district and community television? Well. The school district benefits from community television in that it is one of the primary ways that we communicate our discussions and deliberations about policy. And it's a place where we invite people to come at public speak and have the opportunity to have their ideas and their questions and their proposals um, recorded and then uh, made available regularly throughout the intervening weeks until the next school committee meeting. Um, I think if I can turn the question in a slightly different way, and, and some of my colleagues have already identified this, the, the piece in education that is different and new for many folks of, of my generation, and, and I think um, perhaps older than me, is the amount of marketing that needs to occur. And I think that we are only beginning to figure out the best ways for traditional public schools to communicate effectively with what in many ways is becoming a customer base. Um, and I know some people don't like to use that business language, um, but school choice and charter schools are premised around the idea that competition is a good thing. And that's definitely a market model that comes from the world of, of business. So I would hope that the continued use, for example, this um, later this fall and this winter, uh, when the students at East Hampton High School um, are preparing for their We the People competition um, that they participate in every year. I think having those filmed um, by East Hampton Media and again put up on a regular loop so that people in the community can see the extraordinarily terrific scholarship uh, and work that's done by some of our students. Um, also in terms of athletics, in terms of the arts. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful things that people can't access because they can't physically be there. Um, so I hope that we can continue to expand um, not just because it's marketing, but because it's good uh, community interaction to provide the opportunity for people um, to know what, what kinds of great things are going on in their schools. Great. Sarah, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. How do you envision the partnership between the school district and community television? Um, well, I think, um, I think it's really cool, first of all, that community television is in one of the schools. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really good for the kids to see um, kind of career-wise, you know, kind of what a studio, a television studio looks like. Um, it's cool that they can walk by it every day. Um, obviously, you know the teachers and you know um, some of the students. And, um, so I think that the physical location is really, really great. Um, I think um, a lot of what you were just saying before about, um, you know, it kind of boosting the morale of the students to see their work on display, to see their performances being, um, being given airtime. Um, and I think um, you're also right about the, um, about the competition aspect of it. It's really good for people to be able to see what the schools look like um, and to sort of see um, what it is that the students are doing. So, um, so I sort of envision a partnership that um, just continues to grow, I would hope. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of cool creative things that we can do um, with the partnership between community television and the public schools. Um, and I'd love to uh, be a part of working on that. Great, Angelique. I uh, was not aware there was such a huge partnership already. Um, I there think isn't. it's not huge. Just <laughs> well, to it's me, not, it's huge. I'm so, it a little bit, but so, <laughs> it's there, but it's not huge. So it's not there in other communities. So to me, it's huge right. be, because um, things are really accessible for people that can't make it there. They're working. They're they're um, they have some more than one child, like they're sick, you can still be there. You can still be present at all of these 
things. And, um, you know, sometimes I view things that are, um, my kids are not even in those grades. I'm just like, wow, like I heard really good reviews about such and such. Um, uh, so I I'm, I'm imagine that it's going to get better and better. And, um, and now that I've met everybody here, like, <laughs> then that would just, like, now I see the operation. I think that's so important. So it would just get better. Great. Marissa? Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably end up echoing a bit of what um, everyone has already said here. But yeah, it was kind of exciting to walk into Whitebrook Middle to get to this studio and to be reminded how much um, public education and public TV are really um, important common goods that we have here. And um, public TV is a, is a form of education itself that we have to um, connect with community members. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to make those um, sort of promotional efforts to make our schools and the work of our kids available. I'm also thinking about, um, I don't want to script teachers into more work than they already have, but how <laughs> fun would it be to do um, highlights on different teachers and just do a little um, spot, spotlights where we get to um, highlight their accomplishments and who they are and what they're interested in and um, give people more access to um, who's working in our building. Okay, I'd like to open the floor to discussion on my pet topic. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea, Marissa. Thank you. That sounds well, like take, a lot of fun. I think it's a fair um, criticism to make that we probably have not mm -hmm. availed ourselves enough of the opportunities. And I, I suspect that that's that's true for a variety of reasons, but it, it's great to hear the suggestion in response to an earlier discussion. I was thinking how few people in the community know that the State Department of Education has cited five school districts in the Commonwealth for having outstanding professional development. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that we could get that out is to have that information running that East Hampton is one of those five school mm -hmm. districts. It's the only one outside the 128 um, sort of beltway um, that is put up as an exemplar of outstanding mm -hmm. Um, professional development. It, a, a virtue born of the financial difficulty we face is that we do it in-house in and we have mm -hmm. extraordinary educators here who can do something. The other districts, professional development models involve resources that, that we don't have. So it's really a case of, you know, which one of these is different than all the others and nonetheless just as good. So that's an example of something that if we even had a simple banner read mm. up on um, uh, the community television, I think that that would be that would be really helpful, and that's probably an area where we, we need to devote more time, and it might connect back to what we were saying before about having a volunteer, uh, you know, a parent um, who might volunteer to help us manage some of those kinds of announcements. Absolutely. I really like the idea of, um, of athletics and um, performances being broadcast as well. Um, I think that, that that would have meant a lot to me as a student. Um, I think that would mean a lot to students now and I think and to their parents as well. And you know, like if you get like a student's um, with the internet and with the way that people use the internet now, you know, like somebody puts up a football game that's, you know, been played and then a parent manages to get a clip of it and they share it on Facebook and you see that it's from East Hampton and East Hampton Community Television. And um, I think that's really, really cool and that's good for our town in a lot of different ways. So I'm excited about it. <laughs> I, I just look at um, social media and stuff like this as kind of like a, um, instead of having like a hard copy of a yearbook, like everything's kind of documented in pictures. Um, so it's a little bit more exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, well moving on to the next question, which has been touched on a little bit. Each year, wait, who am I? It's Sarah. Sarah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it seems really simple to keep track of it, and then you don't. So each year we hear feedback that choice in charter schools negatively impact our district. What local solutions can you propose? Um, like local within our district, I guess. Local within your yeah, district. Yeah, like really local. Okay. okay. Um, so I so I think the the whole issue of charter schools. 
Um, charter schools started out um, about 20, a little bit over 20 years ago, as being a way of testing out um, new kind of exciting pedagogies that couldn't, that we didn't really have space for in the public schools yet, just to see how well they worked. And then the idea was that after starting it in this charter model, you would then be able to move these um, new ways of doing education into the public schools. And I think we've seen nationally that that is not how charter schools actually work. Um, a lot of times they start out with those great ideas um, and then for various reasons we're not able to move those ideas into the public schools and now there's a lot of for-profit charter schools that are starting up too that are basically operating in the same way you know that a lot of other schools are operating without a whole lot of new ideas or kind of creative ways of problem solving. So I think we've seen that charter schools are not delivering um, what we were promised uh, 20 years ago when you know the model first was introduced. So. Um, I think locally, like I said, what we need to do is we need to give parents a reason to trust us and to trust us with their kids. Um, some parents have really, really good reasons for not feeling like they can trust us. Some parents are just scared and the charter schools are able to market a little bit better than we are and because um, they, they need to because otherwise people won't send their kids there. So you know, we need to kind of counter that by showing them that our schools are just as good um, or, or better in some situations. So. Um, I think a lot of the ideas that we've already talked about here are really good ideas, kind of expanding volunteer opportunities, um, having those coffee hours with parents um, so that they can kind of come and get to know people ahead of time. Um, you know, making, um, putting more of the more uh, student performances and things on television. I think all of those can make a big difference. Um, but it's not going to be something that we can really change in a simple policy or kind of overnight. We really need to show people that they can trust us and that we're listening. So that's kind of where I would begin. You just repeat it. Yeah. Each year we hear feedback that choice in charter schools negatively impact our district. <laughs> what local solutions can you propose? So I think that I would want to open better lines of communication between um, the parents at the charter schools, even if they're not necessarily from East Hampton, um, and see what the draw is, um, and then see if we have the equivalent and if not, um, if enough people want it, what, what we could do to bring it there. Um, I know uh, my understanding was that they work at the kids level and let the kids work at whatever level they're at, um, which kind of ties into not necessarily like the special ed IEP stuff, but like the other spectrum of kids that tend to be a little bit more advanced and or have different learning styles. So um, I think that if we just, uh, the key is just to listen a little bit more and then sit down, do some brainstorming, and figure out what um, we can do and maybe make like a short term goal of how quickly we want to reach it um, and then a longer term goal. Thanks. Marissa? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think earlier Sarah mentioned that there's that critical moment of like families with four year olds and they're making that decision about whether they're going to um, enroll in the public school here in East Hampton or whether they're going to, to be searching outside. And so um, I think that's a real opportunity to invite those families to come and see the schools and to talk with, I think the PTO actually has organized an event in the past where um, fourth and fifth graders are able to come and talk to the families and to these preschoolers and let them know what their experience has been like in the school so far. And then um, the other thing that I'm thinking about, which I'm not sure how feasible it is, but I wonder do, if we have access to a list of the students who have left our district already, who might be older, um, and perhaps it would be worth courting them a bit, you know, reaching out to them and asking them to come back and take a look at what we have to offer. So that way they know that we are interested in having them at our schools and that we are, would like to give our time to, um, to thinking about what they need and what might draw them back into East Hampton. And then also I want to add that at the level of local politics and local governance, I think it's important to remind our citizens that um, charter schools take our tax dollars, but they aren't accountable to the voting public the way that public districts and the school committee is in fact accountable. It's chosen by voters and then accountable to voters. And so um, in terms of developing local support for our public districts, I think that's a really important issue to um, keep in the minds of citizens. Peter? Sure, this is well-traveled ground for me. <laughs> I am, uh, uh, I, I, the theory is compelling. The reality is devastating. Charter schools have failed, as, as Sarah pointed out, to, to accomplish their mission. The flow of innovative ideas from the five charter schools that 
East Hampton students attend back into the East Hampton school district um, is minimal. There's, it, it barely registers. Um, and, and that was one of the major um, arguments in favor of, of charter schools. They would be um, innovation hotspots that would then improve practice everywhere else. That has not turned out to be true. And in fact, the very nature of the design is that they have it in their self-interest not to share what is unique to them so that they can continue to draw students away. So it, it's not um, difficult to understand why that promise has, has not been fulfilled. Um, I think Angelique, point about who is served well there uh, is also um, clear. Uh, we've done the study in East Hampton and the families that go are disproportionately from the upper end of the income perspective and, dis and are disproportionately not students who need special needs, mm -hmm. which leaves the students in the East Hampton School District um, with fewer resources um, and just as, as great a challenge and has uh, perhaps is part of why some of the concerns have been raised about the, the service to special needs students, although I would argue that uh, East Hampton does an extraordinary job with special needs students um, and that perhaps the reason people are frustrated is they know that they can't find something better in the charter school world um, to serve special needs students. So, um, you know, the final point that I would make about charter schools is that they divorce people from the central institution that defines communities. Mm -hmm. And whatever you may think of them educationally or economically, socially, they atomize um, communities. They make the, a town just a place where people live mm -hmm. instead of a place where they raise their children and, and build their families and build the connections. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Which is great because now we can open it up to everyone else. <laughs> well, an another thing that I was thinking about too is um, you know, we're, we're like kind of in a tight spot here in terms, you know, we've got Northampton nearby, which has a really good reputation. Mm -hmm. um, West Hampton does as well. We have Hilltop Charter right in, um, right in town. So, or Hill, not Hilltop, um, Hilltown. Hilltown. Yeah. So Hilltop's a different place. Um, it's so, confusing because <laughs> they're in an industrial park. Yes. <laughs> but so we're kind of in a tight spot here. Um, we've got several like pretty good charter schools around too in addition to Hilltown. So, um, you know, people can also choice into our district. Um, if they if they wanted to, and if we had a, you know if, if people felt like they they <laughs> they wanted to go here, and uh, some people do in fact, um, and so that's kind of something else we should keep in mind. It's just it's not necessarily like all problems with East Hampton or something that we're doing wrong. We're just geographically very very unlucky in this situation. Um, but that said, you know there's obviously um, things that we could do to improve. Mm -hmm. But I've been thinking a lot just about where we are geographically and how unideal it is in some mm -hmm. ways. <laughs> um, I might be taking this question a little bit out of the scope that you initially mm -hmm. intended, but um, I know we're getting pressure from the governor to increase the number of charter schools in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and it seems like a real responsibility of the school committee as a group of citizens who are particularly invested in the schools to, um, to communicate our concerns about what that will mean for our public schools and to sort of create a, a unified position on, um, on this issue. Mm -hmm. Mayor and the superintendent and I um, sent a letter that yeah. was part of the legislative hearing um, where the governor um, testified. And, and we believe, but we're the authors, so we'll leave it to other folks to make the real judgment on it, um, that it outlines the economic and, yeah. and um, educational consequences of charter schooling as it is and if it were to be expanded. The governor strikes me as an intelligent person, and yet when he says, that this has no negative economic impact on communities, we don't know where the numbers are coming from because just charter alone is three quarters of a million dollars that the city loses. Three quarters of a million dollars in this budget cycle that leaves the city because of students attending charter schools. So I don't know where the, the governor has gotten that, but when the governor gets up and says that, if you repeat it often enough, people will believe it, particularly people who want to believe it because it relieves them of the tougher issue, which is how do we provide families with the choice to go there, but not rob the school districts that they're coming from. Well, thank you so much for sending that letter. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a good letter. But the mayor and the, the superintendent did the, did the hard work of looking at the numbers. Those statistics that I cited earlier about who takes advantage and, and the, the student breakdown, um, it, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. It is the, almost the opposite of what the, you know, the other argument beyond innovation was that charter schools would serve underserved students and underprivileged mm -hmm. students. 
the students in the valley who take advantage of charter schools are not, by and large, the most underserved um, or underprivileged. They tend to be at the other end of the spectrum. And people don't want to talk about that because, again, it puts those families in the very difficult position of taking advantage of something that is legal for them to do, mm -hmm. but is ethically challenging if you are truly committed to the community that you live in. And also, like when we were talking about special ed before in terms of charter schools, charter schools do not provide special education services uh, the same way that public schools do, even though technically they're supposed to. Um, I, I've worked with families of students with um, pretty severe disabilities who um, you know, are, have to go to out-of-district placements, which is not a charter placement. An out-of-district placement happens when uh, the student's needs cannot be met within the school district, and then they're either sent to another school district or they're sent to a private school. And I actually find that really um, sad because those kids also deserve to grow up in their communities, and they deserve to be a part of their communities. They deserve to go to homecoming and to go to prom and to go to you know, school dances and to get to know um, their same age peers and to get to be with their neighbors and their friends and their cousins. And, um, and their siblings too. And so like the fact that we also send so many children out of district because we're not able to meet their educational needs here, that is really distressing to me for the, for the same reasons. So I'm glad that we're um, all working together on that too. I'm just wondering if there would be any benefit because I know we talked about talking to the families from the charter schools, but I'm wondering if we talk to people, if there's a way to talk to kids that have graduated and what they've done and you know, I know I've seen some billboards and stuff from mm -hmm. colleges and stuff like that. Um, if that would help raise the morale of the town at all, that, um, that people are going on and doing right. things and having some benefit from, from what they're receiving and maybe figure out how they made the school work for them. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's a great idea. We walk a fine line <laughs> uh, as a school committee between um, making the case for why we need additional funding Mm -hmm. um, and then inevitably contributing to a sense um, on this issue of morale. And I think the greatest antidote to that is for people to hear from current and former mm -hmm. students and to witness the work that's done by current um, and former teachers and to hear about that because you can get discouraged. The budget cycle weighs very heavily on you as a school committee member. Um, I, I sometimes feel like it's proceeding over a funeral. Um, <laughs> and it's an extraordinary distraction from the great things that are happening. And so you have, to, you have to simultaneously make two arguments to the community. Yes, we need more resources. And look at the tremendous work yeah. that we're doing with the limited resources mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will say, well, therefore, you don't need them. We would say, for example, $750,000, that's 15 teachers. We've had presentation after presentation at school committee meetings, and we need to do a better job of getting this out, where when we target reading coaches, when we target um, math tutoring um, and other ELA support services, we see a jump in the scores that so often is what the public uses to inform their view mm -hmm. of East Hampton. So we do a good job when we have the resources to put it there. When three quarters of a million dollars leaves, we then get the double punishment because we, we no longer mm -hmm. see those jumps, um, and people say, aha, therefore, you know, we, need to, right. we need to make some change. So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult mm -hmm. line to walk between the, the two sides, of, because they're both true. We need more resources, and we're doing a tremendous job with the resources that we have to provide a high-quality education. And you just mentioned 15, could pay for 15 teachers, but Every there's, year. All, right, there's been like a lot of turnover in terms of principals, like at the high school, and some special ed directors, and like I, I'm not really sure why that is. Is it the salaries? Is it, you know, I'm not, I don't know yet, but so that's just interesting to know that all that money could go, you know, might be an incentive towards keeping the teachers here so that the students can go to the same people and the parents can work with the same directors and because um, it's hard to start over mm -hmm. for everybody. Okay, moving on. Thank you for that discussion. That open discussion really worked. It was good. It was good. <laughs> Sometimes debates are a little constraining, and there isn't, there needs to be an expansion of an idea, but there isn't that into the format. Hey, Anderson Cooper did it last night, so we'll do it tonight. <laughs> We're all like on the same page about a lot of stuff, too. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, this question is for Angelique. Starts with Angelique. Do you think that the possibility of using a Prop 2.5 override to increase school funding should be explored? And if so, what would you do as a school committee member if elected to explore such an override? So my understanding, I might need you to repeat it, of the Prop 2.5 override is revolving around 
taxes and having a 2.5% increase. So what was the second half of the? Um, should it be explored? And if so, what would you do as a school committee member, if elected, to explore such an override? So that's interesting you ask that because I'm about to be a homeowner, so that will <laughs> definitely apply to me in a, in a more personal way. Um, yes, I think it should be explored just because I think that 99% of all ideas should be explored because they might not sound fantastic up front. Um, people have initial reactions, but once you sit down and, and figure out uh, how it's going to affect everybody, it can change. And how, how might I do that? Um, how might I explore it? Like, I need to learn more about it, to be honest with you, in terms of um, where the money is going to come from, how it's going to impact each family individually, um, way how it's impacting them financially at home every year versus um, is it helping their child. But it also impacts people that don't have children. So those people are going to be on the fence about it as well. So I guess a little more like outreach and talk to some families that are that, that don't have children in the system, that's, that's how I would do it initially. Okay, thank you. Marissa, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? I think it's all right, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I remember. Um, you know, I think districts and school committees have a real responsibility to taxpayers um, to use the money that, uh, that we we um, take from taxpayers really responsibly and respectfully. And so um, any part of exploring an override means listening to community members who, as Angelique said, may or may not have children in the districts. Um, you know, our, we had a, a question on the ballot in um, 2012, which did not pass, but we were before that able to pass one in order to get the new high school building. And I think that, um, I think Peter might have mentioned this before, that I think that's where the greatest possibility lies with an override, is if we can get funding from the school building authority for a new um, K-8 building or some sort of configuration of new building, whatever that might look like, uh, that that might be a, a way that we can use taxpayer money really wisely to make some big improvements to our structural um, to our structures, but then also to our education opportunities more broadly. Um, of course, you know, ultimately it is up to the voters to decide whether there's the political will here in East Hampton to put that kind of investment into our schools. And as a school committee member, I think it would be um, my responsibility to really communicate to taxpayers what that money is going to be do and how it's going to be used and what ultimately we see as the vision for what that money can do for education, for kids, and then also for the health of our community. Um, taxpayers and property owners here benefit from schools being a really um, in a healthy state. So, um, I, you know, as always, those conversations across um, from administration to educators to families and community members, really keeping everybody's voices in that conversation. Peter? Yeah, I think the question of an override really comes down to direct and indirect benefits to the whole community. The advantage mm -hmm. to an override is the whole community benefits. The, the city council and the mayor would have more resources uh, that they could apportion out across all the divisions um, from the emergency services um, to the public works to the schools. If we do an override for another school building, mm -hmm. that also um, is advantageous to the community, but it is indirectly advantageous to the community as a whole. Um, so I did in, um, in the past support uh, an override, and I still think in the long run, um, a general override. When Prop 2.5 was passed, East Hampton was already a fiscally conservative community. So we were not one of those poster child uh, communities that was, w was spending far beyond um, what m many people in the public thought was appropriate. And then we were stuck with this 2.5% limit and we've been bumping up against it uh, ever since. So in general, I still favor a, a, a Prop 2.5 override um, because I think it benefits the whole community. But I, I believe right now our best bet is to invest our resources in an override for one of the three options um, through the Mass School Building Authority. Um, and I, you know, I'm going to end up saying a lot of what other people have already said here, but I also would support an override um, for the new school building um, in particular. I, f I feel like we have really relatively low property taxes here in East Hampton when compared to neighboring communities. Um, and uh, I don't really see a reason why we need to have 
such low property taxes here. Um, but I also understand that like there are a lot of other people who live in this town. I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> we, um, and we need to make sure that we can make the point to those other folks as well because it is their money. So again, just like we've been talking about all night, we need to show people that they can trust us. We need to show people that they can communicate with us. We need to show them that we're being honest with their money and that we're being honest in what we're telling them. And we need to make them feel like they're a part of the process because if we don't get everybody's buy-in on this, uh, we're not going to be able to do it. So um, I believe very strongly in making sure that everybody feels like they can communicate about this issue and that their ideas are valid, whether or not they have kids uh, currently in schools, whether or not their kids are in charter schools or private schools or out of district placements. Um, it's important for everybody to feel like uh, their voice is heard and that they, so that even if they don't completely agree with it, they might, um, they might at least trust us enough to try it. So that's me. Okay, great. Um, Angelique? Wait, did I, I started, I started it. with you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, any general discussion on that? Key term is investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at times of difficulty, it is often um, extraordinarily difficult to 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 invest because investment is something where you will not see the gains immediately, but you will feel the cost right away, mm -hmm. and yet. Uh, I agree with Marissa and, and my other colleagues here who've said that if we, if we make the decision to invest, this will be a vehicle by which we can turn around school charter um, and school choice. Mm -hmm. And so there's a return. There's a financial return mm -hmm. to the community. Every family that doesn't leave or every family that chooses to return, I think it's much more likely that we can retain people, keep mm -hmm. them from leaving rather than necessarily pulling mm -hmm. them back. Um, but every one of those families, uh, it's somewhere between five and $10,000 of payment on that investment. And so for those reasons, uh, I think that we need to, to frame it. We need to be prepared for some really tough questions. That was one of the most difficult discussions um, that, that I faced as a member of the school committee and as a citizen in, the, in, in East Hampton was talking about the override because it does affect uh, lots of people mm -hmm. in the community um, in, in varying ways depending on their economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. But as a long-term investment for a senior citizen, um, Social Security is contingent upon the earning capacity of young people. So the best bet for the long-term viability of Social Security is a great education system. But that's a complicated argument to make, but it's part of what the school committee's job to make it. Mm -hmm. Would it also be safe to say, like, crime would go down when kids feel good about themselves and they're not as bored, when they feel involved in the schools and there's activities for them to do, um, they're not getting into trouble, like, then it trickles down to the families and the families are getting along better and um, and I just want to like talk numbers real quick so like for like a hundred thousand dollar home which is no home <laughs> like that's like two hundred and fifty dollars a year mm -hmm. and then so you just add that because I don't know if everybody knows exactly how that that works so that'd be right. five like a two hundred thousand dollar home would be five hundred dollars that's rough roughly estimate. what the taxes um, the two and a half means that the taxes can mm -hmm. go up by two and a half mm -hmm. Right, like um, an addition. So an override would be anything beyond that. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Um, this next question is from Marissa to start. Um, how will you deal with budget shortfalls, especially the unexpected ones? And if you had to cut, what specific area would you go after first? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my it's goodness. a horrible question. That I'm going to stop. It's a horrible question, <laughs> but this is a, a reality right. that you all will be facing if you're elected mm -hmm. to this board. That's right. Okay, go. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm going to. I'm afraid I'm going to be evasive on this question, and I don't want to do that. Um, I. I know that that's probably the the most difficult thing that a school committee member faces is when they have to pass a budget. When they have to pass a budget that doesn't have. Um, the funding that's necessary to keep the resources and the services available. Um, I, you know, in what I've read about the budget, it seems like it's really tight as a drum at this point. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine where we could cut um, that wouldn't be really devastating for our students. Um, so I'm afraid that I, I don't have a great answer to this question, and this would again where my um, I think my approach to this would be to really seek out the expertise of, of people who um, might have some savvier understandings of how to work the budget, 
and how to look for places to um, have the, the most minimal impact on our students and our educators. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I empathize with you in the response because ha even having done it, um, it's hard not to sound evasive because mm -hmm. it's a decision we never want to take. Um, an easy way out, which I, you know, on, on more than one occasion, um, is to just stand on principle and say, I'm going to vote for a level service um, or a level service plus budget, knowing full well that the community can't support that. Um, the more challenging end comes, and I remember as when I was serving as the chair, we had to make a difficult decision about reducing a vocational program, a popular vocational program mm -hmm. at the high school. And the testimony that, you know, the, we were in this building, we were right down the the hallway here, and it was standing room only, on one of the rare occasions that a school committee meeting draws that kind of a gathering of folks who express their profound affection and desire and love of what we had and asking us to find somewhere else um, to save the money. And, and we get inform information from the superintendent who gets information from her, uh, her department heads and from the business manager about the challenges we face. Um, and we worked hard to find some other place in the budget that year where we could make the change, and, and we couldn't. So we had to do it there. And I think that comes back to what uh, Marissa was saying before about at some point you have to balance the, whatever the popular desire is with um, if not deference, at least respect for the opinion of the educational um, leaders in the community, um, the superintendent, the building principals, and the department heads, about where do we make this painful c cut in the least painful and the most educationally appropriate way. And then you sit and you work with those two parameters, um, and then you cast a vote. And you have to cast a vote, um, and, that, and then you're on record. And mm -hmm. it's one of the most difficult votes that I've taken as a public servant. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that it was a nearly unanimous decision because I think it reflected the fact that the school committee um, had done its homework and knew that there was nowhere else that we could make it. And it was important to make that decision unanimously because it limited the amount of division in the, in the community afterwards. Sarah? Yes, and I'm also going to be um, irritatingly evasive with this question because I also feel like, as you were saying, Marissa, the budget is really, really tight. Um, I still feel like a relative outsider to this whole process. I'm not on the school committee. I don't have any kids in school right now. So uh, before answering that question, I would really need to do a lot more research um, around kind of what, what we're spending our money on now, um, how much money we need to save. Um, if we cut that money, is that program still going to be able to survive? Or is that program going to have to fold mm -hmm. if that money is cut? You know, those are all things that go into thinking about that. So I'd want to make sure that, um, like you were just talking about, you know, that my colleagues and I were unanimous in our opinion before we went forward with anything. Um, because I think that is a very um, sensitive thing, especially in a district like East Hampton. Um, we'd want to make sure that, uh, that we were communicating effectively and trying to, get, trying to get people to at least understand where we're coming from, even though they're going to hate it either way. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to like say which thing I would cut until I knew a lot more information about what was out there. Okay, Angelique? I wouldn't know what to cut. I would have to look into it. But I'm just wondering um, if it's feasible to, I know we can't make everybody happy, but is it feasible to like send out in the mail or something? Like what are people comfortable with being? cut. I know that everybody doesn't know what the budget's made out of, and, and I don't know right now, as some of you said, so I'd have to look at that, but I, it just, when people feel like they're part of the process, like it take, takes a animosity a little bit, a little bit down, and then they feel, you know, maybe sad, but a little better about the decision, and then, um, and then when we make cuts, are they, are they permanent, or are they temporary? So I think that would be important to, to, um, visit and say, well, you know, there's a potential for this coming back. This is temporary until we can figure something out, so. Any general discussion on this topic? I know it's not, it's not the favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the fun topic. Um, I think that in closing out our evening together tonight, um, I'm going to ask one final question, and then we won't have discussion after this, but it will be your parting thoughts with the audience in, in the city, which is, and I'm going to start, it's Peter's turn, so I'm going to start with you, Peter. What is your vision, and what can you realistically accomplish in the upcoming term? What is your vision <laughs> overall? Well, I, I think 
my vision is that, that the mission statement that we have is a good one. We want all of the young people in East Hampton to have access to a quality education that prepares them for a career um, or college, whichever they and their family think is the next appropriate step. Um, that requires uh, that we be pretty nimble because the kinds of careers uh, that young people are entering now um, often require more than just a high school education that requires specialized vocational skills in high school and we need to work hard to be sure that we can preserve those traditional avenues of access uh, to great job opportunities. The, the collegiate world is more competitive than ever because American colleges have discovered that international students really admire the education that we offer here and so outstanding students from East Hampton are competing for spaces in great schools with um, an even wider body of terrific students. So as with so many things in East Hampton, we have to pursue equity and excellence um, at the same time with limited resources. I do think that the upward arc of the East Hampton public school system and the community are such that we will have the human resources and the fiscal resources with override for the, for the new school building and the positive add-on effects that that will have so that we will, be, we will never escape the tough choices, um, but that we will be able um, to provide the kind of leadership educationally here in East Hampton where folks are going to want to come to this school system and build uh, their family life in this, in this community um, and that they will see their children well served. Um, so my vision uh, for the East Hampton Public Schools is I would like to see a school district where every student has equal opportunity and access to a free and appropriate public education. And currently, free and appropriate public education is the um, legal language used um, when talking about um, a student with a disability and their rights to education within a school district. It comes from the IDEA Act. Um, I think free and appropriate public education is, um, is a really good way of thinking about education generally. Um, students need to be able to access college preparatory courses if that's what they want to do. They need to be able to access more vocational courses if that is more of what they need. Uh, they need to be able to access special education services at all levels and a as many kinds of special education services as possible. Um, I want to make sure that as many students living within this district can grow up in this community. And to me, growing up in this community means going to these schools. Um, so, but that's my vision. Um, and then in the, in the like very short term that I'll have to do that vision, um, I would, I'm hoping to use my, my background and expertise in special education and particularly around education of students with autism and students with severe special needs um, in making sure that those students' needs are being um, addressed and thought of and are kind of a part of the discussion um, as well as the more general population. Um, and I would hope to be able to make uh, connections with the parents of those students, those students, and uh, their teachers and paraprofessionals, um, so that you know maybe their, maybe the programming could improve uh, in the future. I do think that is um, a big, a big issue, um, because I'm kind of a data-driven person. I would love to kind of make like feel like this many students are out of district now, and like by the time my term is over, this many students won't be. I can't actually do that, um, but I wish I could, because <laughs> um, I really want to set a goal of making sure that more students can grow up in this community. So that's it. Great. Ashley? So it might sound a little hokey, but I feel like my, my goal is to, I, I want to be able to meet parents where they're at, or, or families, or kids where they're at, and I just really want everybody to feel so included and welcome and um, that, that a meeting is not like above their level or the language being used is like hard to, um, you know, c calculate and, and I just, I want people to feel empowered. I guess that's what it is. I want, you know, and it <laughs> may be a little hokey, I envision like not enough seats for people because all of a sudden they feel like what they, they have to say matters um, and we're having a good discussion because, uh, um, you know, I don't always, um, I'm not always right. So I need to be able to listen to other people and, um, in, a, in a respectful way and hear what they say and, and, um, and then they'll want to contribute more and, and it'll just, that's, how, that's what I envision. <laughs> okay, great. Marissa? One of the things that I really like about the um, vision statement as it's currently articulated by the school committee um, is that our schools should not only prepare our students to be, um, 
to be ready for either a college or a career pathway, but that it also should be preparing our students to be lifelong learners. And I really like that idea that our schools can be a place that enrich our children's lives, um, not only so they can meet the standards and pass the exams and get, and get their um, degrees, but so they can really grow as, um, as citizens and as, and as humans. Um, and so that, that really requires um, valuing our schools as important centers of our community. Um, in terms of what I can accomplish, um, what, I, what I might be able to accomplish um, as a school committee member, um, I think you know, one of the things that I've learned from studying the history of education is that um, the people who tend to think they really have the solutions are people who haven't yet tried. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to really acknowledge that I think that there is, um, that reform in schools really takes patience and humility and cooperative work and um, working together with people who have a lot of knowledge about what the schools need. And so that means talking to educators and staff who are in our buildings. And that means talking with families who are sending their children to our schools. Um, and I would ultimately hope that um, with, with hard work and with dedication, um, that I could really support the schools as, uh, as the heart of our community, as, as a place that we really um, nurture and commit to, um, to grow and develop. Great, thank you. Well, candidates, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It was a very fly-by-night thrown together <laughs> forum slash debate, and I, I really just wanna just acknowledge that your participation is crucial and it was, I know that you all tried very hard to be here tonight. So yes. thank you for that. Thank and you. Thank you for making thank you. it a success. Thank you. thank you to Mary Cerez and Chris Lindahl for being here and covering it and for your contributions to tonight too. Um, that's it for tonight and tomorrow we'll have the other four candidates. Thank you for tuning in.